I heard this person who struggled with smoking and they prayed and they prayed to be free, made decisions to be free and kept falling into smoking. And one time after a powerful service, this gentleman was walking out in the alley and God showed, his, God showed him a vision. His eyes were open and he saw on electric wires two demons sitting there. And one demon was telling another demon how, look, he's coming from the service. He's going to beat us. And the other demon says, ah, he's done this before. Nothing, nothing good's going to happen there. And so, and the other demon, what he does is he pulls a little plug. He pulls a little wire. And next thing that happened, this man who walks from the church, he's noticing at that instant second, he's starting to have an urge to smoke. So he's noticing that uh, the wire that the demon was pulling was actually connected to him and that wire caused him to smoke. So he quickly realized that his smoking is not just his problem. He got so mad and he literally ran to those electrical wires. He said, I rebuke you in Jesus name and he just tearing, start tearing every wire from himself. And ever since that day, he's never craved smoking again. We have this phrase that sometimes we use as an excuse in our generation say devil made me do it means if you've done something you don't want to take responsibility for you blame it on the devil and it's a humanity's first response towards sin we either blame it on people or like Eve she blamed it on the devil and we have come at the other side of the of this argument is saying devil has nothing to do with anything that we do as people you know he leave him alone he's powerless he's like a toothless uh, a lion and he's defeated and everything is done with but that is also not a hundred percent true no one can commit sin without Satan and no one can live holy without the Holy Spirit can somebody say amen? The first sin humanity committed, Adam had no flesh because he was perfect. Adam had no drug dealers. Adam had no problem on the outside. And the Bible says that there was a serpent in the garden and that serpent tempted Adam and Adam committed sin. I'm not saying Satan will be responsible and Satan will bear our guilt in hell but what I'm saying is this is that we in our as Christians we must understand that Satan many times he pulls the Bible says that he put into the heart of Judas he entered Judas and he prayed to Jesus to sift Peter so that Peter can commit sin we know he put into the heart of Ananias to betray and to renounce and to and to lie to the Holy Spirit and then eventually he paid a heavy price for it well my message is going to be this morning is Satan is not innocent God is not guilty and you are not worthy when good things happen, we take the credit. When bad things happen, we blame God. And somehow Satan always seems to hang out in Cancun. He's on a vacation, takes a chill pill, he's not responsible. And today, we want to embarrass the devil. We want to expose his darkness. We want to glorify Jesus. And we want to take ourselves out of the picture and put Jesus in the center of the picture. Can somebody say amen? In, in first chronicles chapter 21 verse 1 it says this now satan stood up against israel and i want you to see this word and moved david to number israel satan moved david david was the man of god david was after god's heart David was serving the Lord and Satan he stood up against Israel and the Bible says he moved David he didn't make him do it but he pushed him he didn't make him do it but he moved him now interesting part is that a same explanation in the other and I think it's Samuel it says that the Lord rose up against Israel and made David do it so this is a controversy that exists in the Bible. People say, well, in here it says Satan moved. And in the other part of the Bible, what explains the same situation, it says God was angry with Israel and God made him do it. Many times in the Old Testament, things are credited to God that don't have God's perfect will in it. For example, it says God sent a lying spirit to the mouths of the prophet. We know God doesn't have a lying spirit. 
it says things many times what is uh, what it complements God's sovereign will and God who is sovereign it credits everything to him in the Old Testament and people based on that build a doctrine but in order to understand these verses we must understand something very basic there is God's permissible will it's what God allows to happen on this earth and then there is God's perfect will it's the will that is revealed in Jesus Christ where God healed the sick cast out demons stopped the storms raised the dead and brought good into this world that's why the Bible says renew your mind so you will know God's perfect will and you will not live in God's permissible will thinking that is God's will for your life just because something happened on this earth it doesn't make it God's perfect will can somebody say amen see we know Jesus he permits demons to enter into the pigs and the pigs go and self-destruct we know that is not Jesus's perfect will because he doesn't want to cast out demons into your merchandise and crush your business but see the people in that city they didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus they asked Jesus leave and Jesus allows demons to go into the pigs but that is not his perfect will not everything that is permitted is God's perfect will. Perfect will is not in Job or Paul. The perfect will is not seen in your uncle, in my aunt. Perfect will is not even seen in what happens to me. The perfect will is revealed in Jesus Christ. If you can find it in Jesus, you find it in God because Jesus is the image of invisible God. Jesus came to tell us who God is and when disciples wanted to burn city of Samaria and they said Elijah did it they said you don't know which spirit you are in that means you can't take your clues on the heart of God from Elijah Elisha and Moses Jesus is son of God and Jesus healed the sick not one person Jesus cast away who was sick Jesus cast out demons Jesus stopped the storms raised the dead and that is perfect will of God hallelujah now permissible will of God I love this because that means Satan has to ask permission to attack we're just building a coffee shop right now in the lobby that's why you saw this thing that is covered and once we have a coffee shop our church will go to another level in Jesus name but there's one thing in America that you have to do you can't build anything you can't even put a nail sometimes in a wall without going to the city and asking for permission you pay a fee and you get this thing called permit either yellow paper or green paper you have to get a permit you have to apply and the city officials have the right to deny you a permit my bible makes me to understand in psalms that the lord will not permit righteous to be moved that means when satan applies for a permit to move me god says permit denied the Lord will not permit the righteous to be destroyed. Why? Because when Satan applies for a permit to destroy you and God, the heavenly council says, no, 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 you can't destroy him. You may try to tempt him and even attack him, but you can't destroy him. Why? Because your permit is revoked. Somebody give God a shout of praise in this place. Hallelujah. Because when, when I understood the permissible will of God, it, it brought me fear. I'm like, man, that means that Satan can do whatever he wants. And then that verse started to bring me comfort that Satan first of all has to ask God for permission and because I am righteous if the city doesn't give permission for us to build a house or build something that might be in danger to others how much more my heavenly father won't give Satan permission to do things that are in danger to me now that doesn't mean Satan is still not gonna do what Satan does destroy kill and, and attack but God is stands behind his word and God stands for my good as his righteous child not against me can somebody say amen hallelujah praise be to God devil made me do it I want to take a moment for the remaining of this message and actually bring from the word of God on how to be free from the grip of Satan how to be free from the attack not necessarily we can't be free from the attack the only way to be free from the attack is to die but how to be free from the devil controlling your life from the devil holding a grip over your life if you have your bible and this is not going to be on the screen but i want you to open to isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 this verse is describes our savior jesus christ on his mission and his assignment he eventually quoted that as his first sermon isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 and i will read the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to those who are bound and I want you to see in here Jesus talks about freedom and deliverance from demons after this first sermon we see that Jesus started to have actually demons manifest in the church in the synagogue it's a church of like our day and demons were manifesting right there in public and people were brought to the front and Jesus delivered that demon possessed person let me make a little notion the first exorcism in the new testament happened in the church it didn't happen in a private counseling room it happened publicly in front of everybody there is no need to be afraid of deliverance in the church some people in our church you know they're afraid a little bit so when the prayer line happens the moment pastor finishes a message they quickly leave some people are afraid that if demons come out they'll enter them listen if demons want to enter you they don't need to do it for prayer line they'll enter you okay if you think that this is going to happen now if you have phobias then you need to be in a prayer line now running from the prayer line Satan is not gonna what, what, when you believe and I know it's a traditional thing because everywhere I go people ask me the same question if you believe that when demons coming out of other people and they could enter you because you watched a tv show yesterday instead of reading the bible that means that during deliverance the safest place to be is to be as far from God as possible if you believe that Satan can enter you because maybe you have a little bit of faith during deliverance that I also can believe that sickness can come unto you if it leaves me then also this means that if somebody gets saved and they get forgiven of their all of their sins you have to be careful because those sins can an accident land on you which tells us being in the center of God's will is the most dangerous place to be on the earth all of that is a demonic lie the Bible says the trample upon sermons and serpents, not sermons, serpents, and nothing will by no means hurt you. In Greek, word nothing means nothing. In Hebrew, word nothing means nothing. The only thing that can hurt you is if you open your mind and start believing nonsense instead of the Word of God. The Word of God is what we believe in. Not what the grandma said, not what the tradition says, not what they did somewhere in the village. We believe in what the Word of God says. Can somebody say Amen? And therefore, we stay through. And now, unless you need to go, that's a different story. But we come here. There's a lot of people that drive here on the prayer lines. They fly here. So the services go a little bit longer. But we stay till the end. The same way, if I go to watch Avengers, I want to stay to see the battle. I don't leave the whole during the build up and leave during the battle. I want to see the battle. I want to see the Avengers smack the villains. I want to see the same way Jesus' name defeat every demon, defeat every sickness, and defeat every curse, and defeat every problem. And I want to be a part of that. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. Don't be afraid. And if you're afraid, you need prayer. If you, and I'm not talking about afraid, chronically afraid. And it's not in, in a humorous, sarcastic way. You just need deliverance. That's all. Running away from the problems never solves them. Facing them and seeing freedom is what brings solution to our life. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. We read. I want you to see the first key to receiving deliverance from demons. And that is this. Submit to Jesus as your Lord. It means to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus says, I am anointed by God. To bring freedom but then he says the first thing he says I'm gonna bring a good tithing to the poor now we know this means also practically actually he brings good message to those who are in poverty but we know that what this means as well is Jesus brings the good news to those who are broken for those who are poor inside of their spirit the first key to experiencing the freedom from demonic oppression in your life I, I want you to notice what I did not say I did not say to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior because many of us do that. Freedom does not come when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Salvation does. Freedom comes when you submit, not receive. You submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Bible makes me to understand where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The correct translation says this, where the Spirit is Lord, there is freedom devil does not respond to Jesus as an insurance card devil responds to authority 
demons respond to authority and when you have when you walk under authority of the lordship of jesus christ satan reacts toward that the problem with many of us is this is we receive jesus as a spare tire and we pull him out when things get hard we receive Jesus as an insurance card and we pull him out when the police pull, pulls us over. Jesus Christ is not just my Savior, He is my Lord. And some people are afraid to make Jesus their Lord. They say, He'll take all my fun away. He'll cause me to shut down this and shut down that. Listen, I would rather be Jesus' servant than devil's slave. I would rather have Jesus as my master then Satan as my monster. Jesus Christ is your Lord. When you submit to him as your Lord, actually you right away cut off demonic oppression in your life. Did you know that Satan entered Judas during communion? People sometimes come up and they say things, the very, very crazy things, like Christians can't have demons. That sounds very romantic. Sounds very cool and their argument is this darkness cannot live with light in the same place and I understand where they're coming from. I ask them this following question. Christians are commanded to cast out demons. Who should Christians cast out demons from? Non-Christians of course. I ask them the following question. Have you ever done that? No. Okay. If you ever do that you will find this one problem. Demons will tell you that they won't leave because that person is theirs. Why? Because Satan plays by the rules and he has no right to leave that person if they have not been submitted to Jesus Christ the same way you can't kick me out of my own house. Now let's say you're powerful, let's say you're very strong and you come and you force me out of my own house. Oh, it's only until I get a lawyer and sue you. You can't kick me out of my own house. That's the same way you can't kick demons out of their places where they belong. Therefore, who do we cast out demons from? If, if we can't cast out demons out of the people who don't know the Lord until we first lead them to the Lord. Now it's true that our exorcism that happens by the power of God. But if those people afterwards do not renounce Satan and accept Jesus Christ, those demons come back and some, sometimes come back seven times worse. Remember that? So when you actually start to cast out demons, you will quickly find out that many times they're done out of the believers first. And yes, we can argue where do they live, don't worry, they don't live in the same room where Jesus is. It's somewhere in your soul, whether they're inside or outside, we don't know and we don't care. We would just want them out and Jesus in and the Holy Spirit to be in charge of our life. Can somebody say amen? Come back to Judas. During communion, this, this puzzles me. That you can be in the most sacred moment in the life of Jesus. The first communion. Not the first pastor but a first communion and having Jesus give that communion. Not your bishop, not your pastor, not the apostle, not the prophet. Jesus Christ and right there in the communion. Such a sacred place. The power of God is there. The glory of God is there. And you're one of the disciples of Jesus. So it means you associate with the right crowd. You also participate in ministry and the Bible says and Satan entered Judas. How could he do that if Judas associated with Jesus? How could he do that if Judas was with Jesus? If you ever read the Bible carefully you will see this. Judas always referred to Jesus as a teacher, never as a master. Other disciples called him master. Judas never called him master. He always called him teacher, rabbi. If you want to be protected and you want to be free from the devil's grip, Jesus cannot just be your rabbi. He can't just be a motivational speaker or a figure from history. He has to be your Lord. Whatever fear you have for submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is demonic because Satan will do worse than Jesus. Jesus doesn't come to hurt. His Lordship, His burden is easy and His low yoke is light. And the Bible says submit to God and then resist the devil and he will flee. There is no resisting and there is no submission. There is no resisting if there is no submission. Until we submit 
our will to the will of Heavenly Father. And this is more than, Lord, I'm sorry. This is more than, Jesus, please save me. I'm not talking about salvation. I am talking about right now submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus is my boss. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my master and I am happy about it. I'm not a miserable servant. I am his child. I am his son and he is my boss and he is my protector. And because of that, Satan has no authority over my life. Can somebody say amen? I want you to see the second thing in here is that we see he came to preach the good tidings and then he says he came to heal the brokenhearted. See, before he gets to the demon part, he says about you need to establish the Lordship. Who is the Lord in your life, number one. Number two is there needs to be the inner healing that happens. And the inner healing happens only through one way, is forgiveness. Forgive if you want to be free. Before you can be free, you have to forgive. Whatever hurts and pains people caused you, these pains can actually attract demons these things can attract demonic forces Bob Larson, Reverend Bob Larson who was in, in, in uh, Portland this weekend by the way he sent greetings to our church and stuff he was when he was here in, in our country in our in our city I'm sorry last year and I asked him something about this topic and he said Vlad everywhere I go outside of America he says the number one open door for demonic oppression in people's lives is occult he says within the western countries the number one open door for demonic oppression is abuse why because when wounds are neglected they become infected when you neglect the wounds and you say that time will heal it all see time doesn't heal time helps to heal bible didn't send the clock to bring healing jesus came to bring healing jesus is the healer not the clock In book of Acts there was a man named Simon and he was a sorcerer. He dabbled in witchcraft and he participated in all of that stuff and he got saved superficially. He came and wanted to receive the power of God by paying money and Apostle Peter looked at him and said this. He said you are poisoned with iniquity. You are poisoned with bitterness and you are bound by iniquity. Poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity actually in Simon's life probably there has been some kind of an event that caused bitterness to build up in his heart and when he became poisoned with bitterness that opened the door to be bound by iniquity in almost every single place where there is a bondage to iniquity there is a poison of bitterness and if you want to lose the bondage you got to get rid of the poison and the poison is bitterness, the poison is hate, the poison is unforgiveness, the poison is those things that we've allowed to foster in our heart and you may say I have the right to be bitter. Ha! Huh. Satan has the right to hold on to you too. I can't forgive them. Why? Because they need to pay for what they've done. Remember this, if you think you have the right to be bitter, Satan thinks he has the right to hold on to you. And in order to let go of his right, you got to let go of your right to be bitter. And put the judgment in the hands of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. When you let go of bitterness, you break free from the demonic bondage over your life. A lot of people will be free from demons that day that they choose to stop being easily offended and quickly to forgive, love and extend that love that the Lord has extended unto them. Amen. One of the questions we ask during our counseling when people come for prayer line, one of the three questions is this, do you have any unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart? Before, because this prayer line in here is going to be poof, 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 poof. It's going to be really fast. But preparation has to be done. That means you have to loosen the grip of the devil over your life by loosening your grip over the people who owe you. You think they owe you something. If you let it go, then Satan now, his grip is loosed. And you can quickly snap out of it and be free in Jesus name. Can somebody say Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. I want you to see number four. Proclaim liberty to the captives. The, the secret number three to receiving deliverance is this. Is freedom and deliverance comes by revelation not just manifestation. I want you guys to see this. 
in Isaiah 61 verse 1 it says that Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives he it didn't say Jesus came to deliver the captives the way he delivers the captives is by proclaiming liberty into their life he proclaims that liberty see many times we reduce deliverance and freedom to manifestation instead of proclamation or instead of revelation you are free not when you shake and bake you are free when you receive prayer and you receive that knowing I am free what if you don't shake and bake you are free how do you receive your salvation you receive your salvation when you pray the prayer you place your trust in Jesus and you receive that knowing that I am saved if you don't cry you're still saved if you didn't fall you're still saved if you come from this sanctuary and you have doubts you're still saved even if you fall into sin you're still saved now you deal with your issues as a saved person not as a lost person deliverance is revelation not manifestation a person who is delivered can still manifest but they should manifest as a free person because deliverance sooner or later no matter how many deliverances you go through until you come to the truth that Jesus proclaims liberty to the captives he this doesn't give liberty he proclaims it it's up to you to receive it it's up to you to say I believe it it's up to you to say I know it and I'll receive it he proclaims liberty to the captives it's very important to understand that behind every bondage is a lie and behind every deliverance is the truth there is not one bondage anyone can be in that's not built up or has a lie behind it and there is no way somebody can be free indeed without embracing the truth not the facts not the feelings and not what they what they see and what they experience the truth is what sets you free the lie is what holds you in bondage some of you heard a story of the Japanese soldier who this Japanese soldier continued to fight a battle for 29 years when World War II was over he ended up in another country continued to fight this battle for 29 years until this guy who was now a, a, a student in a university and he grew old he heard about the story and he was studying and he decided to actually go and find that man and he looked for him everywhere find him somewhere in the mountains still fighting a battle that's already been finished and he came to him he didn't end the battle the battle was already won what he did is he proclaimed liberty to someone who kept fighting a battle that was already over and this man said this is a propaganda I don't believe it why because it has to be a lie I mean that's not true and he, he kept debating and he kept saying all of this and they brought the news and then they had to actually bring the newspapers and they actually had to bring a general who was now a librarian in Japan who's no longer a general to that young man's hut and tell him listen the battle has been won but it's still you're fighting in here deliverance is God proclaiming freedom into your life it's not always what you feel it's what you know sometimes you get that freedom and your body can still react your soul still reacts toward prayer by jiggling and doing all of this stuff that's why you teach your soul to be still because I know the Lord is God be still and know that the Lord is God live on what you know not on what you feel it's important it's important to understand is that when you still when you receive that deliverance inside of you it's important to understand that when you fall into sin after you're delivered Satan's number one goal is going to be to convince you you are no longer delivered and to drag you through the mud of regret and that regret will feel like repentance but in reality it only messes you up let me give you an example Apostle Peter was warned by Jesus that he will fall into sin 
Jesus told him straight up, you'll reject me and you'll deny me three times. Judas, we know that Judas, Satan entered into Judas and Judas went and betrayed Jesus Christ. And when both of them committed sin, I want you to see this, one commits sin and realizes what I did was wrong. He quickly begins to, the Bible says, Peter cried bitterly when he committed sin. And because he cried bitterly, though Satan tried to sift him, Satan couldn't grab a hold on a man who just committed sin, but he repented genuinely. Satan couldn't, you know, his, his, his head got oily and he, he wanted to grab his hands up, but they kept slipping because when somebody repents bitterly, you can't grab hold of them. See, for Judas, when he committed sin, instead of repenting, he slipped into regret and went into a hyper regret by thinking if I'm gonna go to Pharisees and make it all right my regret is gonna go away and he went into a sinking sand of deeper regret where afterwards Satan hanged him. Satan will always hang a person whom he can trap in regret. If he can trap you in your regret, listen, he pushes you into sin and the moment you fall into sin, he has another trap. And this trap is worse than your sin. It's called regret. If he has you in regret, listen, he has you on his fingertips. It's only a matter of time and he begins to hang you. Maybe not by suicide, but he begins to, you, you, for you to commit emotional suicide, spiritual suicide. Every kind of suicide eventually to lead to a physical suicide. Why? Because whoever he traps in regret, he will bind with death. But when you repent, repentance and regret are different because repentance says, I don't look to my sin, I look to the cross. Regret looks to my sin, repentance looks to the cross regret looks at me repentance looked at looks at the blood regret binds me repentance looses me from my chains because we read about David David was moved by Satan the Bible says when David realized what he did he says Lord I am so sorry and the Bible never makes a mention that Satan bound David again because when you repent you lose yourself some people will get free just by crying you realize what you did was foolish was bad you're not blamed you know the devil pushed you but at the end of the day you are repenting for your part of the deal and next thing that happens is then the, the hand that got your neck begins to lose why because repentance loses you regret cripples you proclaim liberty to the captives and i want you to see the last thing that it says here an opening of the prison to those who are bound. Number four, the part of your life the devil does not have control over is more powerful than the part he controls. The part of your life the devil doesn't have control over is more powerful than the part he does. I want you to see this in here. Freedom comes by we submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Freedom comes by we release any hurt and unforgiveness. Freedom comes by revelation. Jesus proclaims liberty. But in here he also, the Bible says, not only he proclaims liberty to the captives, he also opens the prison doors. That means there's two types of bondages. There's a one where you are a prisoner and there's one where you are a slave. If you're a slave, he sends a word. If you're a prisoner, he unlocks the key. He unlocks the prison. He comes and unlocks the prison but I want you to see what he does not do. He does not drag you out of your prison. He opens the prison door. That means it's a generational curse. Well, the prison door means you have a demonic influence in your life. Jesus comes in and through the prayer line, Jesus comes in maybe through uh, somebody prays with you. Maybe you meet with somebody, you go to a conference, whatever the scenario or the case or maybe at home and Jesus opens the door like an angel did to Peter when Peter was in prison. The angel came in and the Bible says the door was open. The guards were asleep, the chains fell off and angel hits Peter and says this, arise, put on some clothes and follow me quickly this is what i find out about people about us jesus comes opens the door shines his light and we get very happy very happy the service is over and next thing that happens is the next day 
those guards that are asleep when you are awakened will wake up you have a very short moment of time to leave the prison what is a prison it's your mindset it's your habits and it's your friends he opens the prison door but he doesn't drag you out he asks you arise put on some clothes and follow me quickly that means if you got prayed for you got about an hour or two before those guards that Jesus set you free from wake up and this is what could happen in a day they can be hanged and you can be promoted but if you chill here if you hang out here if you don't walk out from your prison a wrong mindset wrong habit and a wrong set of friends if you don't walk out from your prison the guards will wake up and next day there will be reinforcements but if you wake up and you say Jesus I'm gonna follow you quickly oh I don't want to make radical changes right now I don't want to delete numbers I don't want to get rid of some friendships I don't want to change I don't want to dump all the weed I don't want to throw away all the drinking I don't want to cancel this and that why I don't want to get too hasty I don't want to get ahead of myself well this is one problem if you don't do it quickly these homies and cronies that you've been connected to for years they're gonna wake up if you want to be free you have to walk out from the prison of a wrong mindset walk out from the prison of wrong habits that means starting right now when the lord touches you you make a decision i throw away the cigarette and once and for all starting right now you're saying you know what that's it i'm deleting that that source that through which i fall into pornography starting right now you're saying you know what this friend has doing this been doing this and been doing this and i've been falling into this temptation you know what i walk away from that and when you walk away from that the holy spirit will lead you into a new season he will lead you to a new friends yes Peter came to this house and they said you're a freak who is that is that his angel I means sometimes the new environments will think you're a freak will not even receive you yet you gotta hang in tight why because the enemies you got freed from are gonna be executed they will never find you because you went away from them quickly you follow the Lord quickly How do I become free? I submit to the Lordship of Jesus. I receive healing and I receive revelation. Jesus sets me free. And lastly is I walk out from the moment Jesus cracks the window open, the door open. I run from there like a crazy guy, following the Lord quickly, leaving my prison, my mindset, meaning this, I'm no longer bound. I am free who's still fighting the devil. I'm no longer sick I am healed who's fighting sickness I'm no longer weak I am strong who's fighting weakness I'm no longer defeated I am victorious who's fighting defeat my mindset changes I'm not a victim I'm a victor who's still fighting a victim tendencies but I'm a different man I change my habits means I make a decision to read God's Word daily I make a decision to talk to God daily I change my environment that means anybody who pulls me down any toxic people I distance myself from them why because I am on a path I can't live a positive life surrounded by negative people I make the decision thank you for watching this content I hope this was a blessing to you if you're like me and you like to click on things click on this subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.